This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Singer-songwriters Jerry Vandiver, Ann Buckle, and Tim Buppert on this edition of Conversations. We welcome to our program three Music City Industry veterans. Jerry Vandiver has written hit songs for classic country artists like Gene Watson, as well as modern day hit makers like Tim McGraw. Besides writing and performing, he helps aspiring songwriters through his songwriting workshops and a workbook he and his wife Gracie co-wrote together entitled Your First Cut, a step-by-step -step guide to getting there. Despite being related to one of country music's most traditional families, the Carter family, Ann Buckle's path to Music City has been anything but traditional. She is a Harvard graduate, a classically trained violinist, fluent in French, and a former diplomat at the U.S. Embassy in Paris. These days, she is bringing her own unique style and interpretation to the country music genre. Tim Buppert writes songs, but he's also a pretty good singer. He is one of Nashville's most celebrated session singers, having sung on over 8,000 demos. His voice has been heard on jingles as well, things like Pepsi Cola and Love's Diapers. His songwriting credits include Kevin Sharp's She's Sure Taking It Well and Another Nine Minutes by Yankee Gray. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks, thanks for having, for having us. us. All three of you sort of have just like a different way you came into the music business. Yeah. Let, me, look, let me start with you, Jerry. How, how did it all begin for you? Well, it, it all started for me when I was actually a school teacher in Kansas City, Missouri, my hometown, and I was playing songs for my kids as part of a lesson plan, and I finally said, you know, I don't want to do just playing songs for kids, and started making treks to some music centers, both L.A. and Nashville, and and after a couple of years, I decided Nashville was it for me. So I just packed up my stuff and moved here and dove in the deep end. Wow. wow. Yeah. And you obviously come from, I mentioned the Carter family. You're re related to them. So a long tradition there. So, but Harvard, Paris, all these, you know, really cool <laughs> places. <laughs> how, how did you get back to Nashville? So I always had a dream of moving to Nashville and doing the singer-songwriter thing. But my parents are both school teachers and I was pushed in to getting a real job for a while there. So I went to college and studied abroad and tried a couple other things and then eventually after grad school realized, nope, my heart's in music and I wanna go to Nashville and try it out. Yeah, yeah. how about you, Tim? Well, I started at a real young age playing drums. So I was always a singing drummer till I was like almost 30 years old oh, when wow. I realized that that was kind of the top of that level, so I didn't want to get a real job, so I <laughs> decided I, I'd try songwriting. It seemed like a regular thing, a daytime right, thing, right. and so I moved to Nashville like these guys and just figured it out, you know, day by day. I yeah. mentioned you were a session singer. Yeah. Explain what a session singer is. Well, I didn't know that sort of thing existed until I moved to Nashville. I thought you were either like a country music star right, or you right. played in bars that's all I knew and so I moved to Nashville and started playing my songs in songwriter clubs and somebody asked me if I would sing a songwriter demo and I once they explained to me what that was I said yeah sure mm -hmm. and so I, I didn't realize there's a whole bunch of people in Nashville that that's their sole job is being a studio singer player whatever and Fast forward to now, I've sung like on, like you said, 8,000. Wow. And you just, you know, somebody, they give you a, a work tape. You, I used to get cassette tapes back in the day. Okay. And, uh, and you learn it, you go in the studio and you sing it, and then they pitch it around town, try to get it recorded. Okay. So you're really an integral part of it because, I mean, I guess your interpretation of it or how you sing it may make a difference to where the song gets recorded, huh? I like to think they couldn't do it without me, but, <laughs> but it's not true. It's not. It's really not true. But but sometimes, you know, there have been a couple of songs. I sang a song called "Don't Laugh at Me" that wound up being Song of the Year, and they had been pitching it with the writer's voice on it for a long time, and they were like, oh, for some reason, this is not getting recorded." And I sang it, and it got recorded quickly. And I don't know necessarily if it was because of my performance, but that's how it happened. Yeah. Jerry, you've been around for, for a while because you're, you've had things recorded, as I mentioned in the open, by you know some of the classic right. the Gene Watsons, but yeah. also like Tim McGraw and stuff. How has the industry changed over your career? Well, uh, it, it, in, in the days of my Gene Watson cut, I, I really think there was kind of a, 
a pure difference between there was the community of songwriters and the community of artists. And the songwriters would write the songs, the artists would go looking for songs, and if we were lucky enough, they met. And on, a, on occasion, that happened for all of us, actually. Uh, these days, it's a little more, there's a gray area between the songs and the songwriters. A lot of times, the, the writers, uh, instead of being inspired by something that just happened to them in their lives, they will get together with the artist a lot and, and, and other songwriters and even some people that write tracks and kind of combine all of that at one time. So becoming uh, uh, aligned with a, 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 an artist uh, is a really important part of the songwriter's venture today, whereas before it wasn't so important. Yeah. And we mentioned your relationship to the Carter family. What was it like growing up knowing that you had such a steep tradition in country music? And I saw some pictures of you and Johnny Cash and June Carter. When I had my braces and a missing tooth, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and overalls, and I never washed my hair. Um, some things don't change, though. Is that true? <laughs> um, it was great. I think when I was about seven or eight years old, two of my uncles, Bugs Cornett and Mike Cornett, who are related to the Carter family as well, had a studio in Bristol, Virginia. And that was my first time ever in a studio. And I got to play my violin for Johnny Cash and hang out with June Carter. And they were just family, so it didn't really feel crazy back then. But now that they've all passed, looking back, I'm like, wow, that was a pretty cool childhood. Yeah, 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 no kidding. How about the, uh, 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 you said your mom and dad were school teachers. Yeah. So were they, they were not involved in music at all? Or? Not at all. My mom wow. was a PE teacher. My dad was a US history teacher. And uh, my uncles are really who got me into it. When I was six, one of those uncles who owned the studio, who had played on the road with Johnny Cash a lot um, earlier in his career, um, he got me a violin and said, you're going to play this. And I did. Okay. Hmm. And so. you're classically trained in the violin. Yeah, because yeah. my mom, who knew nothing about music, <laughs> um, just signed me up for lessons in our hometown of Fayetteville, Georgia. And yeah. yeah. Has that helped you, do you think, Absolutely. overall? Mm -hmm. It has, and I think um, I went to school for music in undergrad and also political science, but the music training um, has helped me become a smarter songwriter, and I can choose chords that are a little more out of the ordinary and create string arrangements for um, tracks, and I think I really appreciate it now the more that I become a producer myself. Right. I've asked this question to probably almost every songwriter I've interviewed, and I've interviewed a lot of them over the years. So I'm just curious, for you guys, and get all three of you to answer this question, how do you go about writing a song? Is it a mechanical business? Okay, I'm gonna sit down at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna write some songs, or is it I'm knocking back a couple of drinks or whatever, and I'd, I'm all of a sudden inspired, or a little above? The answer to that question is yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> all the above, right? Yeah, it really is, yeah. it really is. I mean. Um, it's it's kind of funny. I, I have feelings for my friends here too, but song ideas constantly bombard me, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. And if I'm lucky enough to write them down or put them in the phone now these days and come back with them, um, you know, I, I, it, it's really it all begins with the idea, and and how you want to. Then you start thinking about how you want that idea to unfold, both lyrically and musically. A lot of the, one of the most popular questions we get all the time is, "What comes first, lyrics or music?" Right. And again, the answer is both. You know, and you just they come together and, for me and, and meld together. And, but it really starts with the idea, which constantly is around us everywhere. Right. Yeah, I don't know. If that how about helps. you, Anne? Same. S same way. Same way, and sometimes a song takes 20 minutes to write. Yeah. It just pours out of you. Yeah. I have a song I've been working on for a year now, and it's still not right. So there's really no formula for most people, I think. Right. Just they all kind of come in their own way. Tim, you agree? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have some songs where you start with the, the idea, the title, and you figure out a nice, clever way to craft a song. And when you get done, you usually have a nice song. And, mm -hmm but a lot of times it's not emotionally moving. Right. Um, for me, the best ones are the ones where you just kind of start talking with your co-writer and it's something that you, you kind of both can relate to and next thing you know, there, a song is finished and you don't really know how it happened. You know, you just kind of, wow, it's a nice song. I want each of you to play a song for us that you've written, and uh, I told Jerry, I said, I'm going to, you know, Tim McGraw gets all the headlines and people talk about him in a modern day, but I go back a few years, and I was a big fan of Gene Watson, I thought he was a great singer, and of course you wrote a, yeah. wrote a great song for, for him. Tell, tell, tell us the story, and then I want you to play it. Uh, well, when I, when I set out to write that song, um, first of all, I had never had a, a song recorded as a songwriter. I'd been in town about four years, and I was hitting the streets hard, and <clears throat> but I had just recently had my heart broken, 
And uh, it, it was a weekend and I was feeling sorry for myself, but then I said, don't waste this weekend on the blues, you know? Do something with yourself. And so I wrote a song called Don't Waste It on the Blues, but it was pretty self-indulgent. That Monday I had a co-writing appointment with uh, Sandy Ramos and I played it for her and she goes, oh Jerry, we can turn this into a hit. Doesn't have to be about you. And I said, I'm all about that. So we wrote the song and uh, went through the standard thing of playing for our publishers and, and then making a demo of it in the studio. I didn't know Tim at the time, but I'm sure I would have hired him to sing it if I'd known him then. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it, one of my publishers that I worked with uh, pitched it to Gene Watson's people at A&R at Warner Brothers Records. And so he recorded it. And about four months later, they decided to release it as a single. So it was not only my first cut, <clears throat> but it was also my first single, went to number five. But the important backstory behind that, yeah, for me anyway, <laughs> is that Warner Brothers Records, like a lot of record companies, they hire independent record promoters. And they did for this one because they really wanted to see this first single do well for Gene. So they hired this woman who should go unnamed. And, um, and she worked really hard. And she really was the instrument behind taking that song to number five. And she was the woman that broke my heart, that inspired the song. <laughs> I love it. I always say I took my pain to the bank and she didn't get a dime of it. You know, so it's a true story. Hey, now there's a good title for a song. Yeah. I took That's my a pain good to point. the bank yeah. and she okay. didn't get a dime you, for it. You probably want co-writer on it, I'm sure. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Well, do the song for you us. Hear? Okay. <laughs> this is called Don't Waste on the Blues and it uh, was recorded in 1989, which is what, five years ago? Yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> it uh, peaked up in, uh, on Valentine's Day, 1990. Number five. I know there's nothing worse than a bad goodbye. And you think you'll feel better if you have a good cry. But save those tears for tomorrow. When there's nothing better to do, it's a beautiful night. Don't waste it on the blues. Well, time is all it takes for a broken heart to mend. And sooner or later, you know you'll try love again. So why not start tonight? You've only got the hurting to lose. There's a full moon out. Don't waste it on the blues. Well, don't waste one more minute. Believing a bad break should keep you home in the dark. There's nothing like a walk in the moonlight to let love run away with your heart. You could turn on your stereo and play your saddest songs. Sit by your window and stare out all night long. But if you look up, you'll see the stars are just too bright to refuse. It's a good night for love. Don't waste it on the blues. Mm -hmm. Don't waste it on the blues. Awesome. There Great you know. job. Thank Great you. Job. Great job. Gene Watson recorded that song. Wonderful singer. Yeah, he's amazing a amazing country singer. Well, they call him the singer singer, I think. They do, that's yep. right. Yep. 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 That's yep. a good yep. point. I know more about that yeah. than you thought. You do. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about the song you're going to do for us. It's entitled, uh, Where Did I Go? Moonrise, right? Yes. So I released this song last year in 2017 as my first single of a new project in which I go by Wildwood. Wildwood. So I wanted to pay homage to my family, and they had a song called The Wildwood Flower. and so all my new stuff is not Ann Buckle, but Wildwood. Okay, let's yeah. hear it. So here's Moonrise. Darkness falls at night And doubts keep pouring 
angel running around got me wondering now if you love me the same as I do you. Will you still love me when the stars fade away? Will you still love me when the night steals the day and when it gets dark? Stay where you are, or will you be hiding? When the moon's rising, when the moon's rising, midnight creeping through the clouds here. Your footsteps on the ground I'm hanging on to the hope that you're not gonna go And you'll wait here with me As I will you Will you still love me when the stars fade away? When the moon's rising When the moon's rising Yeah. All right, very, very nice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's great. I'd stay with her with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard not to close your eyes when that song yeah. plays. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Tim? You got yes, what, sir. Trisha Yearwood recorded the song you're going to sing, huh? Yeah, she recorded this song, but it did not make the record. Okay. okay. So uh, Nashville is a very humbling place <laughs> to be. You know, when I moved to town, I had songs just like these guys, and I had people tell me that my songs were really good, and you come to Nashville and you find out they're okay, but they're not as good as you thought. Right, right. And then so you st start trying to write new songs, and... Everywhere I turned, I'd write a song, and people would say, yeah, I've heard that title a bunch, and so I couldn't come up with a unique title. I remember I wrote a song called uh, Queen of Denial, because I heard Oprah say it. Uh -huh. Somebody was the Queen of Denial. Yeah. And I took it to a publisher, and they go, they pull out a CD, and they go, oh yeah, that's on the Pam Tillis yeah. album. <laughs> I'm like, you gotta, and he, they wrote it way better than I did. So I, I had a goal to write a song that I know knew no one could possibly have written the title so it came to me to write a song <clears throat> based on your word problems in school mm -hmm. so my concept was if a train left for Memphis you got this couple you got a person that's in say Nashville and this woman is in Memphis and her love is decreasing at a certain rate and he's got to figure out how fast and you get the idea I <laughs> so I wrote a whole verse and took it to some songwriters and and they, were, and they were like, you know, I really like that, but I feel like I need a calculator because it had all these figures. And so they straightened me out, and we fixed it up. And uh, we wrote it, and Trisha Yearwood recorded it. Like I said, it didn't make her record, but it's been recorded by seven or eight other people that are uh, not as popular as Trisha Yearwood. But. So it goes like this. I won't play the whole thing, but you'll okay. get the idea. <laughs> Far west of the Mississippi And so far north there's a foot of snow How I wish you could be here with me I didn't want to but I had to go I got the feeling when I hung up That you missed me less and less Long distance loving ain't enough So I guess the question is If a train left from Memphis at four in the morning Would 90 miles an hour be fast enough With 2,000 miles and six states to cover Would you still be waiting up? If a train left from Memphis Would it be too late for us? Mm -hmm. 
I dropped you a card and sent you flowers and all the letters there's time to write. I hope my name in the darkest hours will be the last thing on your lips tonight. I've got to make up all the ground that too much distance brings. I'm packing my bags and I'm leaving town. God, I wish these rails were wings. If a train left for Memphis at four in the morning, would 90 miles an hour be fast enough? With 2,000 miles and six states to cover, would you still be waiting up? If a train left for Memphis, would it be too late for us? If a train left for Memphis, would it be too late for us? Whoa. Awesome. Love it. <laughs> Great job. Yeah. You guys are just so talented. You know, you, you, you were talking about when you got to Nashville, just all the competition. And we were talking in the green room about the competition. And Nashville is really becoming sort of the it city right now in, in, in many facets. Um, if, if a young singer songwriter goes to Nashville in today's world, is it is it just country music or is it a broad spectrum of music today? It's a huge <laughs> spectrum. You know, I, it's, it's a great question. I, I moved to Nashville in 1984. Clearly at that time, it was country music. It was 16th Avenue, blinders on, let's get some songs recorded in the country music genre. Right. Now it's everywhere, and it's really exciting for me because there's just great singer-songwriters everywhere in all kinds of different genres. In fact, in East Nashville, where Tim and I both live, there's almost a, a culture of singer-songwriters over there that openly declare, we are nothing to do, we have nothing to do with Music Row. We are singer-songwriters, Americana, folk, pop. independent rock, pop. Yeah, it's amazing. And as a result, a lot of the bigger names have moved to Nashville as well to kind of become a part of that culture because Nashville is such a great city to live in. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah, it truly is. And when you sit down to write a song, are you thinking genre or are you just trying to write a good song? Do you think I'm, this is going to be a country song, this might be a pop song, might be a... Well, myself, you know, if, if I'm connected to anything, it's, it's more the country music side of things. Like if I wanted to try to get a song to... I w name any pop artist, I wouldn't have a clue how to do that, okay. you know, but if I was going to try to get a song to Tim McGraw or somebody, uh, Rascal Flatts, whoever, I'd like to name somebody more current, but I don't even know who they are. Uh, uh, what's the party you guys named? John, John Party. Party. There you yeah, go. John Party. I know his guitar player, so, you yeah. know, but I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't have a clue how to get a song to some pop artist, so, you know, and, and I don't, I don't write traditional country songs that often, but country music is not traditional country anymore no. anyway. <laughs> so, you know, like what you, what you were saying and what Jerry was talking about, the, uh, you know, one of the reasons that they're recording so many different styles of music in Nashville is because the studios have really, it used to be there was a saying in Nashville, they take great songs and make bad records out of them. And pop music, they take bad songs and make great records out of them. Well, now the studios in Nashville are on par with any any in the world, you know, so they record everything there now. Yeah. What, what about you, Ann? Yeah, I think for me, when I first moved to Nashville, I felt a lot of pressure to write country music because of my family. Right. And I, a couple of years in, just got honest with myself and realized I'm classically trained and I lived in France and I have all these other influences so my music now is a lot more pop and indie pop and folk and I do record in East Nashville at a studio mm -hmm. called South by Sea and um, it is a hub for people like me who aren't really country anymore maybe we started there but we're kind of on the fringes now and um, it's a really cool place to be and mm -hmm. there's a lot going on yeah yeah neat I'm getting a little short on time here, but I want to ask you, Jerry, what, what's this canoe thing you have? <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, I know you don't have much time. Well, I, I'm a very avid outdoors person, a canoeer, kayak, camper, paddler. And, um, you know, it's a good question around songwriting. They say write what you know. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, I caught myself writing a song about that. But... Jason Aldean is not going to cut a song about canoeing in the boundary waters of Minnesota, you know? <laughs> so I just put it aside, and then, but there's a lot of trade shows and festivals and stuff, and I started kind of volunteering myself to play at them, and it just exploded. In a, 
it, it wasn't a it wasn't a piece of dynamite. It was more like a firecracker. <laughs> but but it's still I found an audience and I'm just having a blast performing. Anne has performed too, at them with me. They're okay. great. And They're it's the just, best we, fans. We, I have fans. I mean, they buy yes. all our records. Like yeah, they buy all my CDs. And we go canoeing with them. They sing along. Them. They know yeah. the song, my songs better than I do. Okay. So that's the short answer. And if somebody wanted to find out more about it, how do they do that? Go Is to paddlesongs.com. Paddlesongs.com. Yeah. Okay. And very good. They can find out more than you ever want to know. <laughs> and quickly, tell me about your nonprofit. Yes, yeah, so I work with refugee teenagers in Nashville to teach them how to share their stories with the world through original songs. And we have an album out of that, and it's called Three Chords. Okay. Uh, like three guitar chords, so yeah. Okay, okay. What's that like, sitting down and working with young people like oh, that? Oh, it's great. The kids that I worked with over the last couple of years have been from Iraq, Burma, Myanmar, Thailand, and they're just full of energy and spunk and want to be part of you know this culture and this country so I'm just here to help get them into the community in Nashville and telling their stories. Right, right. Tim, what do you got exciting going on? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, well I play in a bunch of bands. I'm, I'm back to playing drums and singing again and um, so I play in a lot of different bands and th that's, they're all different. I play in a Beatles band, a Steely Dan group, a 70s band, an R&B group. And I leave in the morning to go do a show in Mont Eagle with one of those bands. And I mean, it's not, it's, it's exciting to me because I love doing it. But uh, that's, that's what I got going on, moving on to the next show. Great, great. So where would someone find you? Uh, I have timbuppert.com. Okay. I'm not even sure if it's working, but <laughs> <laughs> go check it out. Go check it out. Real quick, Ann. Yeah, annbuckle.com. And jerryvandiver.com as well as paddlesongs.com. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you all so very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for having us. You are so, so welcome and, and, and welcome to Florida. Welcome to the Thank beach. You. Enjoy yourself. We love it here. <laughs> it's a pretty good place to hang your head. It is. Yeah. I wish yeah. you guys all the very best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Great, yeah. great. By the way, more of our conversations with songwriters and many other interesting personalities are online at WSRE.org slash conversations as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by Gulf Power, a Southern company, and by viewers like you. Thank you.